Hello, brothers and sisters. Welcome to my channel. And if you're not a Christian, I'm glad that you're here. I'm excited about this video. This sort of uh, gets at more of what I'm interested in doing and the wider concerns about the beauty and truth and goodness of the Christian worldview. In this video, I'm going to try to give a sort of condensed one-stop shop case for Christianity. Uh, for the truth of Christianity, and it won't be exhaustive, of course, uh, otherwise this video could be like 10 hours, uh, but I will link resources for each part uh, that I am covering in the description below. As always, my dog might join us, so uh, there we go. Okay, so here's the method of this video. What we're going to do is we're going to see what picture of the world emerges when we use the resources of reason and philosophy and history. And once we get a picture of the world, then we're going to ask, is this a good fit with the Christian worldview? So it's not so much going to be a deductive case for Christianity, but a kind of cumulative case that shows Christianity to be the best fit with the available data. And so we're going to look at uh, what picture of the world emerges when we consider consciousness. What picture of the world emerges when we consider morality and beauty and order and contingency. And then when we consider the Christian story and the claim, we're going to look at the ubiquity of sin, our inability to atone or make amends for our sin, and our alienation, our sense of alienation from the divine. And then we'll look at some of the historical evidence for the resurrection. Again, each part could be covered in more detail. I would love to eventually produce videos that go in depth in each part of this argument. But this gives you a broad sort of sense of the cumulative case for Christianity. Okay, so let's dive in. So first, I want us to think about the nature of consciousness there it is there's my dog okay so consciousness right uh by consciousness i mean subjective experience so thomas nagel has a famous paper what is it like to be a bat where he asks the question what is it like to be a bat right what is it like to be my dog maya who barks at everything that passes by the door uh, i don't know but Presumably, there is something that is that it is like to be Maya, right? Or when I taste strawberries, the sweetness of a strawberry is it feels like something. I experience it as something. So experience is the content of consciousness. So consciousness is that which experiences, okay? Now... I want to raise what I, an argument I've developed actually uh, called the descriptive challenge uh, that I think implies the irreducibility of consciousness. And the descriptive challenge goes something like this. The law of identity states that if A equals B, then whatever is true of A is true of B and vice versa. Right? Pretty intuitive. Now, the descriptive entailment, I argue, of this is that if, if it is true that A is identical to B, then in describing A's intrinsic properties, I am, in fact, describing B's intrinsic properties. And what I mean by intrinsic properties is, suppose you look at a circle on, on the wall or in the camera, and you sort of in your imagination, you shrink everything down in the universe to that circle. And then you just start describing what you see. That you describe intrinsic properties. So intrinsic properties are those properties of the object when we're just considering the object in and of itself. Now, the reason I make this distinction uh, is to avoid problems that might arise from what's called the de dicto terre description, right? And that that uh, distinction goes something like this. Uh, Lois Lane thinks that Superman is uh, a journalist. Now, that's false as a de re description, but it's true as a de dicto description. 
So what that means, right? So by de dicto, what, what that kind of means is that the one that Lois Lane thinks, uh, the one that, that Lois Lane thinks that uh, this object, who is in fact Superman, is a journalist. That's true. Of course, she doesn't think that object is Superman, but she thinks that the object that the word Superman identifies is a journalist, right? Clark Kent. But it's false in a de re sense. She doesn't think that Superman, considered in himself as Superman, is a journalist, okay? Uh, another way to, to sort of get at this distinction is to say, uh, I see the morning star, right? Now, I could, if I told, if you said, I see the morning star, and I told another person, yeah, Timmy was saying that they were seeing Venus this morning. So that would be true in a de dicto sense, in the sense that uh, the object that you saw is in fact Venus, but it's not true in a de re sense, insofar as you did not consider that object in and of itself Venus, or at least not necessarily true. That's kind of a way of getting at this. If none of that made sense, don't worry about it really doesn't matter. The, the thing I want to get at is that if A equals B, then in describing A's intrinsic properties, that which is true of it in itself, uh, you are in fact describing B's intrinsic properties. So physicalism is the view that consciousness is purely brain stuff. It is nothing over and above brain stuff. That's the claim. Brain stuff being the, the obligation of neurons and, and electric impulses and this sort of thing in your brain. Now, if consciousness is brain stuff, is identical to brain stuff, then in describing consciousness, you should be describing brain stuff. But you are not, in fact, doing that. Therefore, consciousness is not brain stuff. That's a standard modus tollens. So, uh, premise one, let's defend these premises. So premise one, recall, is if consciousness is identical to brain stuff, then in describing, uh, well, if brain stuff is identical to consciousness, then in describing brain stuff, I am in fact describing the conscious, the contents of consciousness. And this goes back to that descriptive entailment I was just talking about earlier. Let's say I see a dog off running in the distance, right? And I'm trying to determine, is that dog Maya or not? right? And I start describing uh, the intrinsic characteristics of that dog. Now, whether I know it's Maya or not, if that dog is Maya, then in describing that dog's intrinsic properties, I'm describing Maya's intrinsic properties. Um, so similarly, if brain stuff is consciousness, then in describing your brain stuff, I should be describing the contents of consciousness. Now here's the problem. That's ostensibly not the case. So I use the example um, of Mary the Taylor Swift listener, right? Now Mary is an avid Taylor Swift fan. She goes to the Eras tour, right? Uh, and she's listening to, to uh, uh, we're never, ever, ever gonna get back together, right? And Here's the question I want to ask. A bunch of scientists, they've hooked up with her free consent. They've hooked up uh, an advanced MRI scan. They know her brain down to the smallest detail as she's listening to uh, we'll never, ever, ever get back together, right? Now, here's the question. Physicalism would have it that the experience of listening to uh, Taylor Swift is identical to brain stuff. If that's the case, per the descriptive entailment I just outlined, then in describing the contents of her consciousness, you should be describing what it is like to hear Taylor Swift say, we are never, ever, ever getting back together, right? Uh, it, and here's the thing, it doesn't matter if uh, the, what's interesting at least about this thought experiment to my mind, is it doesn't matter if the scientists know that she's hearing Taylor Swift sing that line at that moment. The question is whether they can describe Mary's experience by describing her brain stuff at the moment of her hearing that, uh, that line. 
Now, if Mary goes back to them and say, says, you know what, describe to me what it sounded like <laughs> to hear Taylor Swift say we are never, ever, ever getting back together, right? And they just describe the arrangement of brain stuff. It's exceedingly obvious that they're not describing to her what it sounded like. She would quite clearly, I think, say, no, like it sounded nothing like, what are you talking about, right? She said, describe to me what it's like to hear Taylor Swift say we're never ever getting back together. And they tell you, well, you know, neurons and axon potentials and blah, 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 blah. Like th that, that wouldn't even get close. And therefore, consciousness is not brain stuff. It's different. It's irreducible to brain stuff. Okay, so we have this. Now, let's think about, okay, well, well, is consciousness maybe an emergent phenomena from the brain? Now, to think about this concept of emergence, right, we have to understand that philosophers of science and other philosophers, other metaphysicians, Typically, when we talk about what's called strong emergence in the case of consciousness, normally emergence means that things, when they work together as a sort of collective system, take on behaviors that we wouldn't have predicted from just analyzing the parts. They behave in new ways jointly. So uh, the properties of H2O, right, to stick to things, um, as it were, like that's that's an emergent property. It's a property of the collective that we wouldn't have been able to to predict. But it's not some thing over and above H2O mo mo molecules. It's a way, an unexpected way, or at least not a predictable way from analyzing the parts that these molecules are behaving in relation to each other. There's no thing called stickiness over and above the interaction of the parts. So you can describe stickiness uh, in terms of uh, the relationality of the parts or think about like a hurricane or something like this. Hurricanes are often thought of as emergent phenomena or tornadoes or whatever, but all of those phenomena are the joint interaction of things. They're not some thing over and above the joint interaction of their like microphysical base, their, of their microscopic base. So the claim for it, <laughs> If consciousness is emergent in that weaker sense, right? Well, the descriptive challenge uh, follows, it targets that. If it's not, um, if it's, let's say, emergent in the stronger sense, we have quite a different problem. Namely, that it, if it's strongly emergent, it's still irreducible. So, so this idea of strong emergence doesn't actually, contra non-reductive physicalist, it doesn't actually get you to something physical because you have something that is not identical to the physical there. That's the whole point of strong emergence. Uh, consciousness uh, is, again, per my descriptive entailment, if it is brain stuff, so a non-reductive physicalist wants to say, well, yeah, consciousness is brain stuff, it just, it just can't be described in terms of physical stuff. But my descriptive challenge, my descriptive entailment of the law of identity challenges that claim. If consciousness is physical, then in describing the former, I should be able to describe the latter, at least when we're dealing with its intrinsic properties. Um, now, here's the interesting thing. When I flip this around, and Jonathan Edwards, George Barclay, John Foster, uh, and many others have pointed this out as well. If I flip this around, what I notice, actually, is that matter actually seems to be reducible to the contents of consciousness. Here's what I mean by that. If you think about a stop sign, you think about its redness and its shape, and you take away all of the contents of consciousness, you have taken away the whole stop sign, right? So everything I'm experiencing, my, my visual field right now, right, of this world before me, belongs to the contents of consciousness which means that the material world seems to be reducible to consciousness, actually. Uh, if it's not, right, if there's something over and above consciousness uh, that's sort of beyond consciousness, then my subjective perceptions wouldn't really be able to correspond to it. In other words, if there's this thing called matter 
that's a different substance other than consciousness. That is to say, it's non-consciousness and therefore non-phenomenological and therefore uh, other than that which is proper to experience. Then I literally have no idea what it is, right? Like it, 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 your experiences literally could not correspond to non-experiences. Your experiences can't yield information which is also experiential about something that's outside of experience and so matter seems to be reducible to consciousness and this actually solves a lot of problems the interaction problem famously how does an immaterial mind interact with a material substance uh it actually solves that problem uh by saying actually you don't have two radically different substances interacting you have one uh overall substance which is consciousness now there are two ways to understand this either everything is my consciousness which leads me to solipsism but i have strong reason to think that's not the case right there are things seemingly external to me that affect me i seem to be radically dependent at least i have a sense of my radical dependence on a system of being outside of myself uh, from that system of being outside of myself things affect me uh, so solipsism doesn't seem to be true. Uh, or uh, there is a sort of joint consciousness, a kind of field of uh, phenomenality, a kind of field of consciousness in which I live and move and have my being alongside many others. So from consciousness, we can understand the world at large to be a kind of phenomenological system we inhabit a kind of joint phenomenological world which embraces us okay so now we, we've gotten that peg so there, there's this picture of reality that starts to emerge right consciousness can't be reduced to matter matter can actually be reduced to consciousness and we seem to be embedded in this sort of joint phenomenological field okay now let's think about uh, what morality tells us further about reality. When we think about morality, right? Uh, let's think through some of the constituent elements of moral experience. Part of our moral experience is to consider all people as equal in dignity, right? So ideally one wants to treat uh, black people as equal to white people in dignity right one wants to treat men and women as equal in dignity if physicalism is true right that is to say again there's nothing to the world beyond physical stuff if physicalism is true then there is no ground for the equal dignity of persons so note what i'm not saying here at least not yet i'm not saying that god uh, if dig if um uh god does not exist then dignity does not exist dignity does exist there go god exists that's not my argument my argument is if physicalism is true then equal dignity does not exist because if we're purely physical then there's literally nothing equal about us the equal dignity if the world is purely physical and the being of humans is purely physical the claim of equal dignity must identify a physical thing or it's identifying a non thing because there are no physical things on a physicalist picture of the world. But of course we are not physically equal. Uh, men are physically stronger than women more generally uh, are generally speaking uh, more physically, you know, <laughs> uh, they, they can, they're physically stronger, um, uh, more kind of athletic, uh, that sort of thing. Um, though the reason I'm hesitating over that, cause I'm like, Oh, like birth is its own kind of strength, but you get what I, you get what I mean. They're not equal. Um, now people have different heights, uh, different capabilities, right? And so it would seem like we have to say that people are unequal. Well, Sean, people are equal in that dignity just identifies the fact that everyone's human. 
and everyone's equally human insofar as everyone just is human, right? Every human is human by just, you know, just tautologically, that's true, right? Here's the problem with that. First, on physicalism, it's not clear that there can be anything like biological essences. That is to say, the word human just identifies a sort of range of biological creatures that have a family resemblance to each other. It's not clear that there's some sort of essence that the word human is identifying. But secondly, uh, and more to the point, this would just be to say that equal dignity just is the fact, right? That people are equally human. Well, Sean, equal dignity supervenes on uh, the fact that everyone's equally human. Okay, but if dignity is a thing that's not physical, right? Even if you say it supervenes on it, right? It, it's just sort of kind of connected and hovers upon it, uh, dependent on the fact that we're all equally human but not reducible to it. Uh, well, then that's a non-physical fact and therefore physicalism is false, right? Uh, there's some aspect of reality or some layer of reality that's not properly speaking reducible to the physical. But it's, but all of reality is then dependent on the physical, right? Well, um, again, so, so one could make that claim, but this doesn't at least seem to me to be properly a form of physicalism. And, and here's why, right? If consciousness is let's say uh, all of them, let's say substance dualism is true, right? And yet all of the contents of consciousness are preceded by some sort of biological effect, such that consciousness is wholly deterministic. That doesn't seem like a form of physicalism insofar as there, this, there is this other substance, even though all of its movements depend on something logically prior, that's in itself distinct. In other words, there's nothing to distinguish a deterministic version of substance dualism from so-called non-reductive physicalism and therefore it would seem that non-reductive physicalism doesn't deserve the name something similar would apply here in the case of dignity now i also want to suggest that moral objective uh, moral values and duties are tenuous on physicalism uh, such that they're they're not it doesn't seem conceivable that there is some objective standard now we're going to address in the next slide biologically sort of based construals, but in terms of duties, I just want to focus on that here. Now, when we think about moral duties, right, what I want to, to sort of locate this to or coordinate this, this concept to is this idea that there are things we ought to do and things that we are, we can be held accountable for, uh, for failing to do. So it's somehow morally blameworthy for, for failing to. On physicalism, determinism almost inevitably follows. What do I mean by determinism? I mean that if physicalism is true, then all of the, the movements of my brain, right, are conditioned by factors external to my brain. So my brain's not this sort of self-moving thing. It, for example, came into being through an act of my parents and through DNA, then kind of assembling my brain, uh, thing, external stimuli stimulate my brain, moving my body to do certain things, interacting with my environment, which stimulates my brain, etc. If physicalism is true, if that is all there is to me, then all of the contents of consciousness are sort of externally determined by the movements of my brain. And therefore my free will is not free at all, right? It's moving in accordance with a sort of causal nexus of reality that's external to me, causing me to do the things that I'm doing. Now, suppose the reason this is problematic is it can be kind of illustrated this way. Suppose a scientist hooks up uh, some sort of electrode, or actually, this is a good example, right? Uh, someone sneaks a love potion into Ron's chocolates and Ron falls in love, right? With, you know, some rando. Uh, Ron's not morally responsible. Or if some scientist, unbeknownst to you, hooks up your brain to electrodes and stimulates it to that, that makes you do certain things. And initially you're caught, but then we find out, oh, there were these, these things, this sort of system, this nexus in your brain that was stimulating it to make you do these heinous acts of murder or whatever it is. You would be exonerated from those acts. You would not be accountable for doing those acts. And yet, 
I think we acknowledge that moral responsibility is so necessary conceptually to the coherence of a social life that we can't dispense with the concept. Well, Sean, that doesn't mean the concept is true. Technically speaking, that's true. But it does seem like pragmatically, our experience, our, the experience of our daily lives, our life together, our common life as human beings requires that there be something like moral responsibility. And it suggests that something like moral responsibility actually exists. Now, we're also going to cover in this sort of section on morality, the fittingness of the moral law as a kind of mode of communication. Here's what I mean. If the first two arguments show that morality is not reducible to physical stuff, and this is something, you know, jo Joe Schmidt, I was watching, he critiques moral arguments, uh, and he critiques Craig for sort of setting up the argument as such, like, if God does not exist, then objective moral values and duties do not exist, objective moral values and duties do exist, therefore God exists. And I get it, like that formulation, it takes a few steps, it needs to be broken down into further steps. But my formulation has been this, well, if uh, physicalism is true, then objective moral values and duties do not exist, they do exist, ergo physicalism is false. So we get a picture of the world that's uh, more than just purely physical. Now, how do we know that morality is uh, it points to a creator or it's sourced in a creator. Well, I want to suggest that the moral law seems like a kind of mode of communication. That That is to say that when I experience the moral law, I apprehend it as an imperative, in many cases at least, uh, I apprehend it as the imperative to treat my neighbor as equal in dignity or the imperative to uh, go and serve someone else. But it's the kind of imperative that's issued and only relevant to sentient beings, to beings with consciousness. Now, in our experience, it would seem that is if there is a directive issued that's only relevant to sentient beings, that is, as it were, aimed at sentient beings, then that command originates in a consciousness. So even if a computer right, is generating imperatives for me, I recognize the computer as sourced, as originating and emanating from, as it were, consciousness, right? It is a sign uh, that points to consciousness as that from which it originated. Similarly, it would seem that the moral law is a kind of mode of communication that tips me off to its origin uh, as emanating from, uh, you know, a kind of lawgiver uh, a kind of communicative agent because the imperatives are explicitly seemingly directed towards consciousness. Again, they're only relevant to those who have consciousness and have a will, a sort of robust, morally responsible will uh, that can respond to these commands. Okay, now we need to address rival theories of morality uh, to sort of round out this picture. So there are several accounts. There are utilitarian accounts. Uh, utilitarian accounts roughly want to say that, well, uh, morality is about maximizing pleasure, maximizing happiness, maximizing some non-moral good, right? Whatever it is. So typically uh, under some of the older formulations like Jeremy Bentham, it was about maximizing pleasure. And there was something he called hedonic calculus uh, which is the calculus of moral actions, such that you do whatever maximizes pleasure. And that runs, uh, for the most amount of people, runs into some seriously, obviously problematic <laughs> scenarios, right? So, uh, for instance, if we found that it would maximize... Uh, so, on this theory, right? So, if you see a guy shooting up a theater, the reason it's just to kill that person is because it maximizes pleasure for the whole of humanity. But this is a problem as an account of moral action. Uh, and we can show that through an example like this. So suppose that we found out that killing the elderly, right, would maximize the pleasure of human society. We sort of run this calculus through an advanced AI or whatever. We find we'll have more resources to go around, right, or this sort of thing. Or killing babies might do this, and, or killing, killing certain uh, ethnicities of babies or whatever. Uh, 
would maximize pleasure, it would still be wrong to do it, right? It would be wrong to kill the elderly to maximize the pleasure of humanity. Um, now, John Stuart Mill's uh, sort of modification of this is to suggest that there are higher and lower forms of pleasure, right? Or higher and lower forms of happiness or enjoyment, more noble ones. And so for him, um, let's say we think it would maximize pleasure uh, to, uh, you know, for people to to have a giant orgy or whatever, right? Um, we think, well, that would maximize pleasure. For Mill, it's not worth doing because it's not maximizing the most noble kinds of pleasure. So one should opt for Mill to forgo, let's say, a sexual thrift uh, thrist, uh, to listen to a symphony, because the symphony is a more noble sort of pleasure. Uh, appreciating beauty for him is a more noble sort of pleasure. The problem with this account, of course, is that Mill is appealing to a kind of axiology, that is to say a theory of value, by which to determine that certain pleasures are more noble or not, right? So there's some sort of value scale he's using that's actually prior to his consideration of the max of maximizing the good of pleasure that determines which ones are worth maximizing and which ones aren't which means he's not actually at the end of the day a, a consistent utilitarian right there's some sort of value scale that goes beyond just the sheer experience of pleasure by which mill determines which ones are more noble or which ones are less noble and once we sort of unpack this value scale, it doesn't seem like, again, it could exist on physicalism. There's no really clear, uh, if we think about physicalism, right, we take a kind of God's eye perspective of everyone running around, right, with their different ideas of right and wrong. There's no like standard hovering over and above these different people by which to measure which of their ideas are more right or more wrong than another. And so they're just kind of running around with their ideas of right and wrong. <laughs> Uh, with no sort of standard to appeal to, or no sort of value hierarchy that's hovering sort of enmeshed in the universe or something like this, uh, by which we can measure the nobility of certain kinds of pleasures. Now, Kantian accounts of are, are based off of um, Kant's, Kant's imperative, the categorical imperative, right? And essentially, this is going to simplify just a little bit, but the categorical imperative is this. You want to do that which you would be okay with uh, uh, becoming a rule for all people, right? So let's say I uh, steal something. Kant thinks it's wrong because if it became a rule that all people just would steal, right? All people can steal. We would have mass chaos, okay? Uh, or if so, so instead people should be honest because if honesty is a rule, then that forms a cohesive society, uh, and society flourishes. This sort of thing. So what can reason discern for Kant? Um, uh, for for what what can reason universalize? What can reason see uh, would would be a good rule to universalize for all human actions? Okay, so what's the problem with this vision? Well. First, uh, it's actually, this already depends on there being a kind of virtuous people, right? So let's say you have a society that is just okay with everyone sleeping with everyone, right? Uh, I, I'm not sure that, that that would make that okay. That would make that an okay thing to do. Or suppose that you sort of, um, you, you qualify the rule, right? So someone who steals bread, Kant goes up to them and says, okay, well, that's wrong because uh, you're, you're stealing uh, bread. And if that became a universal rule, that would destabilize society, right? Well, then the person might reply, well, I'm only stealing bread in thus and such circumstances, right? My family doesn't have enough money. And that's okay with being a, a universal rule, right? Because our moral actions don't exist in a vacuum, right? It's very rare that our moral actions are sort of inscribing abstract principles or propositions. They're typically flowing from character. I'm more, more to put my chips on the table where I lean more towards virtue ethics. But in any case, they typically flow from the kind of person we are. 
Um, and for Kant, um, if you have a kind of very qualified rule, right? So someone, let's say, commits murder. Kant says, oh, that's wrong because if murder became a universal rule, then society would be destabilized. Well, the person replies, well, I'm only murdering uh, in these specific circumstances. And if, if that becomes a universal rule, that is to murder only if these specific conditions are true, uh, then yeah, that's okay. I'm, I'm okay with that, right? Well, that's a huge problem with the categorical imperative because it treats principles as abstract principles when in fact we act in particular circumstances that are incredibly qualified. Okay, uh, what about uh, contractualist accounts of ethics? Now, contractualist accounts are roughly, from what I remember, I, I might be wrong about this, uh, so I will again link resources in the comments, but contractualist accounts are sort of envision us as in a moral community. And morality is a kind of language, right? We together contract with each other uh, certain moral rules, just as language is sort of contractualist, right? So for instance, the meaning of the word, um, I don't know, patriot in America, right? Has a certain connotation a certain denotation that is agreed upon by a linguistic community. Similarly, morality is kind of a set of rules that's agreed upon by a community. Well, of course, the problem with this view uh, is that there is no way to determine moral progress. When language changes, no one thinks that language is making progress. Like, the fact that we've moved from Latin to English isn't progressive necessarily, right? Some people think it's regressive, but I don't think that's true, but uh, it's not necessarily progressive or regressive, right? When language changes. So if morality is sort of akin to a language, there's no reason to say it's progressing uh, in this, for the same reason that there's no reason to think language is progressing. Well, what about naturalistic virtue ethics is something um, Joe has pointed to. Um, again, similar problem. Why is it that certain character pieces for a naturalist are desirable or for a physicalist? Um, if you say, well, it's because of, of how certain biological organisms are going to flourish. So for instance, it's more desirable to give water to a plant so that the plant flourishes. In a similar way, it's more desirable to be kind because you will flourish being a kind person, etc. But again, it's not clear that, um, at least from a physicalist perspective, that kindness makes one flourish more than selfishness. So here's the sort of example, right? Suppose you have Timmy and Tom who both spend their weekends serving people, right? They minister to the poor, they give their, their resources to the needy, they spend their time uh, volunteering at their local community soup kitchen. They externally are amazing people. But uh, Tom actually does it just because he likes people praising him. He likes the approval he gets. Timmy is doing it uh, solely for the other person because he loves those needy people. He wants to see them flourish. I think we'd want to say that Timmy's actually doing it more virtuously. He has a better character, but it's not clear that Timmy is actually, from a physicalist perspective, flourishing more than Tommy. There's nothing about that. Tommy might actually, he might have incredible amounts of joy or subjective pleasure or whatever it might be in serving, uh, you know, in serving soup or whatever. It's not clear that he would be flourishing uh, any less than Tommy. Now, there are also ideal observer accounts, namely, well, an idealized observer. What would that idealized observer looking at any moral situation want? The problem, of course, again, is that we imagine ideal observers from the perspective of us, the non-ideal, right? So we project outwards and our projections, it's incredible. I just don't, I don't understand the notion that we could somehow project and apprehend what the ideal would be 
used from the sort of situation, the lived reality of our own selfishness and our own um, sinfulness, uh, our own brokenness, right? Our projections of the ideal are going to be tainted by our particular circumstances. Okay, so to summarize that, um, to bring some of those threads together, morality and the equal dignity of persons suggests that persons are not purely physical. Morality, and that therefore moral reality, is something more than just physical reality. And moral reality strikes consciousness as a kind of imperative, in the mode of an imperative that's directed towards conscious agents. And when we encounter imperatives that are directed towards conscious agents, our experience tells us that those imperatives which are directed towards conscious agents, are uh, they originate, they emanate, as it were, from a conscious source of those imperatives, uh, a sort of conscious, um, a conscious foundation from which those imperatives, as it were, emanate. Okay, here we're going to start to examine beauty. Now, remember, let's sum up the picture so far. So from the irreducibility of consciousness, we have a world that is not reducible to the physical. Consciousness is more than brain stuff. But on the other hand, matter seems reducible to the contents of consciousness. And so we seem to live in a richly sort of, as it were, phenomenological world, a world constituted by consciousness. Given that solipsism is probably false, right? This view that actually everything is just my consciousness, it's probably the case that therefore we are in a kind of shared consciousness. But the sort of same considerations that would lead us to think we're in a simulation uh, actually would better lead us to think that we are in fact in a consciousness or sort of upheld and emanating from, as it were, uh, a consciousness. That's the foundation of our being. Morality uh, suggests uh, that that there's this sort of imperative coming to us uh, from a conscious agent. What does beauty suggest to us? Well, there's several, I think, striking characteristics of beauty. I go more into this uh, in my own article on beauty. I'll put that in the comments in the journal Religions. But beauty seems radically connected to love. So in the tradition of both classical philosophical thought and classical theological thought, beauty engenders love. In the symposium, the Diotima, uh, sort of this woman that, that Socrates encounters, and he asks her to explain what the nature of beauty is, and she does. And for her, beauty is this kind of environment or atmosphere in which goodness begets goodness, right? So, so goodness, for Plato, uh, is sort of seeking or stretching to be eternal. It's, and this means begetting more copies of itself, right? And this is kind of the point of life. So for instance, in, in sexual reproduction, right? The good of, sexual, of the sexual act is reproduction. So goodness aims to sort of extend itself. And what draws one person to another in the sexual act is beauty. It's the environment in which goodness begets uh, copies of itself. So beauty for Plato is sort of the atmosphere in which uh, goodness begets things. Uh, for Plotinus, he calls beauty the sort of porch of goodness. <laughs> uh, beauty is sort of the, the pull of goodness, the draw of goodness. And Marsilio Ficino, who's a Renaissance writer, uh, makes the same point. Beauty is thought to engender love, to sort of stir love in the heart. Beauty comes to us as a kind of gratuitous gift, right? Uh, when we encounter beauty, we feel as though we're graced, that we're, we're given uh, a gift, when I look at the stars, I feel grateful, right? When I look at the Grand Canyon, one feels grateful. So what this suggests is that 
in the experience of the beautiful, I am tasting something that's very much like love and very much like grace, very much like being given a gift. Now, does beauty make sense on naturalism or physicalism? Here's why I want to suggest it doesn't. On a purely sort of physicalist account of human origins, we have evolved through billions of years of evolution, through random mutation and natural selection, such that the parts of the biological organism that we are are ordered towards survival. We are what we are in order to survive. So the claim goes. Now, if that's the case, then the things that are true of us are true of us uh, for survival. So the why is it, for instance, that we form friendships? Well, on an evolutionary account is because it's easier to secure survival goods in community, right? So we actually make friendships uh, in order to get goods that help us survive on this account it's sort of a it's kind of a bleak view of friendship it's kind of it's a mercenary picture of friendship is what it is but i digress okay uh now here's the thing let's think about all of the rich diversity of the experiences of beauty right when i look at a sunset i am doing it for its own sake there's nothing in consciousness that suggests that one experiences the beautiful in order to get some other good that helps them survive beauty in other words is the sort of thing that is sought for its own end this is what was noticed by kant it was noticed by edmund burke it was noticed by jonathan edwards thomas aquinas just a whole lot of people right that beauty seems to be a kind of end in itself uh, sought for its own sake and not for some other end now, the evolutionist wants to say, well, there's just some sort of like underlying uh, reason that it's it, it sort of, it, it's for survival, right? But the thing is, even, even if that were true of friendship, right, because you can give a kind of plausible sounding story, like we actually do it because having friends helps us build houses and hunt and stuff like this, right? Uh, that's not true for beauty, right? Beauty helps us do none of that stuff. Uh, looking at beautiful things helps us do none of that. And yet it is that for which our soul was made. If beauty was not part of our environment, we would wither. Which suggests that uh, <laughs> beauty is the kind of, is a kind of food of life. It's a kind of food for the soul. Uh, it's that upon which we are nourished. And that suggests then that the notion that we are here purely by physical, physically determined evolutionary forces is not a true account. It's not an exhaustive account of human origins. What I wanna suggest is that beauty makes much more sense as a mode of love, actually. Uh, that is why when I look at the beauty and the mystery of a forest, or of a preserve, right? Why people write letters, millions of letters, right? To, uh, to forestall the building of a pipeline uh, in order to preserve a forest is because in the experience of the beautiful, one feels the sort of pull of love. And so beauty suggests that in and through beautiful experiences, something is loving us. <laughs> something is communicating love to us. And so I want to suggest that beauty suggests the presence of a gift giver or of a lover extending itself in and through the beautiful. Okay, so let's summarize the picture so far. Remember, uh, consciousness suggests that the world is more than just purely physical and in fact physical reality can actually be reduced to consciousness beauty suggests that uh there is or morality rather suggests that dignity the objective moral value of persons cannot be reducible to the purely physical and moral imperatives come to consciousness as a kind of form of communication 
beauty suggests to us that we are in fact being loved in and through the beautiful. Order, now we reach, uh, I wanna suggest order is a sign of intelligence. Here's what I mean. When I approach, let's say I were to go, this is actually an example, I think that was used by William Dembski or something like that, but if I were to go to a planet, right, and see a bunch of symbols, let's say like two dots, and then four dots, and six dots that are kind of evenly spaced, right, or I were to see a set of symbols that are patterned or have a kind of structure, I would suspect their origination in consciousness, that is to say, I would see those as signs of intelligence that point to an intelligence, right? Or when you play a game of chess, you can tell that the game is, originates in consciousness by the fact that it has order imprinted into it. It operates by rules that repeat themselves in and through the game. Now, that's not to say things within those rules can't be random, right? So a chess player presumably can move within those rules without having any sort of thought, right? Any sort of uh, reason for their movement. They can just be doing random stuff, right? But in so far as you can perceive order, we take that in these other cases to be a sign of intelligence. That is to say of an intelligence in which that or from which that order was stamped, right? We can tell when someone is is partaking or is, is in, uh, using a strategy in chess when there's a kind of definable pattern to their actions, right? And so through the repetition of that pattern, there seems to be a sign of intelligence impressed into a thing that indicates intelligence. Now I want to to motivate this argument just a little bit more through things like the nomological argument, right? So the nomological argument says this. I think it says this, hopefully I'm getting it right. Uh, I think Dustin Crummett and a colleague wrote a, a paper on this. Um, I'll hunt that down as well as I'm editing the comments <laughs> or my, you know, my video description. Uh, but there's my dog, you know. Uh, but the nomological argument says this. Suppose in a game of poker, right, the dealer is dealing cards and they deal to themselves the same hand every single time, or they deal to like player two the same hand every single time. There are like 500 hands dealt, and the same hand is dealt to player two every single time. You would start to suspect that someone is monkeying around, right? That this is sort of the result of intentionality and of um, conscious activity, of intent. It is a product of the will. Similarly, when we consider physical laws, it seems to be the case that things operate in this fairly consistent way, right? If I drop my pen here, right, I can know it's going to drop, right? I can fully anticipate now that's kind of an odd thing, right? Now, when we think about physical laws, a lot of people sort of on the ground, and this, in philosophy of science, there's a huge debate right now over the status of physical laws. Um, but in fact, physical laws, their, their kind of ontological status, what they are, are very dubious, right? Uh, and I would argue that they seem to be nothing more than descriptions. The law of gravity is just a description of the fact that this body moves towards uh, the Earth, the body of greater mass, right? That it moves towards it. That's all it is. Magnetism is a description of the behaviors of things which actually play out in certain relational contexts, right? So if you put a magnet over an iron, the iron gets attracted to the magnet. Magnetism is just a description of, of the fact that that nail will tend towards the magnet given the right relationship, the relational context between the magnet and the nail. So we find ourselves then in a world in which, um, uh, the, in, in which laws are sort of regular 
And like the poker de game, we are sort of dealt the same result uh, consistently every single time. Uh, and we find ourselves operating in this sort of set system. This is the sort of thing that actually like people used to argue, like maybe we're in a simulation, right? In Minecraft, Minecraft is governed sort of by a set of consistent rules, which is why the outcome is predictable uh, because the rules that govern it are consistent. But by the consistency of those rules, in the consistency of those rules, we see the stamp of intelligence from which that consistency originates. So when we look around us and we see a law-governed universe, it would seem that that which tips us off to intelligence as the, the sort of emanating source of that order, in the case of Minecraft or board games or languages or whatever else, should tip us off to the fact that this universe is impressed with a sign of an intelligence at least. Now this doesn't get you to monotheism, but it suggests that there's an intelligence, uh, uh, at least one, that's impressed itself into the structure of the universe. Now, uh, because I'm running short on time, I don't have enough to cover nomological, enough space right now to cover nomological harmony. I'll link that below as well. Uh, I'll also link below psychophysical harmony as well in subjective experience. Now, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll just link that below. We'll keep going. Okay, so uh, contingency. Here's what contingency also uh, leads us to, to think. Now, let's think about an infinite chain of, of dependent events. So I'm going to argue that causal finitism, right, this view that any sort of chain of events uh, in which one event or one element depends on a prior element for its being is finite, um, if it's real, right? Uh, any sort of state is that's uh, that's in this chain of dependent elements has a terminus or a beginning point. And here's why. Let me use an analogy. Suppose I were trying to get a raise in my salary, right? Uh, TEDS at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, right? And suppose I, I have to ask my boss, and my boss has to ask his boss, and let's say there are an infinite amount of bosses, right? That So it has to go up the chain, and it has to go down, right? Would the raise ever get to me? It seems quite obvious, actually, that it wouldn't, right? So if, if there's this unlimited chain, this unending chain, of events for that race to come to me, it would seem that the chain would never end such that it would actually get to me. So if you have a series of dependent elements, it would seem that element X, right, which depends on element X minus one, which depends on element X minus two, you know, etc. X can't exist until, until all of the prior elements exist. But all of the prior elements would never come into existence. It would never, so, so the chain, the proverbial rays, would never sort of come down the chain to X in order to spring uh, the existence of X. Here's what that suggests, right? If that's true, if causal finitism is true, right? Then here's the picture of reality that emerges from this. We have an overarching state of affairs, right? So let's say, let's call uh, everything that exists right now just a state of affairs, right? The difference between S, this exact moment, which it captures everything that exists right now, uh, exists in a chain such that S1, the state right after it, emerges given any change in the U in all of existence at all. That is to say, the difference between everything that exists right now as S and S1 is any sort of difference, anything that's changed uh, in every, in the sort of total system of existence. Now, it's clear that S1, right, so where we are right now is dependent on the state of affairs that preceded it. So there was some uh, change from a state of affairs right before now 
that led to this state of affairs. It would seem clear that this state of affairs and the state of affairs that just includes at least one change, that that subsequent state of affairs, S1, which will be the state of affairs that includes at least one change, depends on S. And S depends on the prior state uh, that prior to which, uh, from which it, it has at least one change, etc. right? Add, add infinitum. Um, it would, if causal finitism is true, what this means is that uh, there's a primal state of affairs from which, which precedes all change. A, a primal state of affairs that is the sum total of everything that exists, which is prior to all change. And from this primal state of affairs, it contains within itself the resources from which consciousness, beauty, and order emerge. So there's some foundational primal state of affairs at the foundation of reality that contains in itself the resources which lead to the consciousness of individuals and paired with our argument from consciousness, this primal state itself is a primal state of, of consciousness from which uh, beauty and order and things like this emerge. So let's sum up the picture so far. From consciousness, we learn that we live in a kind of ideal, by which I mean proper to consciousness, uh, world, right? Idealism seems to be true. From morality, we learn that the world is not purely physical, that uh, people have equal dignity and therefore physicalism, which cannot ground that, is probably not true. Physicalism is also false, given the fact that uh, on physicalism, there you can't hold anyone reasonably accountable for their actions, and yet human and moral experience seems to tip us off to the fact that we can do that. Um, now, one might say, well, morality is just bunk, right? It's, and I didn't cover this, but here would be a quick argument for moral realism, right? And it's I've thought this through as the argument for moral affections, right? So the fact that we are equipped with certain kinds of emotions tip us off to the existence of realities which would fittingly evoke those emotions. So uh, I am equipped with the capacity for fear. That equipment shows me that there's something in my environment to which fear would be uh, adequately triggered. It would be fittingly uh, a fitting response to a, re a reality. Uh, that would evoke it. Now, there can be unfitting responses, right? I can be irrationally fearful, but the capacity of fear that I'm equipped with uh, signals the fact that there's probably something in the reality in which I exist to which that emotion would be fittingly evoked. Similarly, moral affections are distinct kinds of affections. I get annoyed when I stubbed my toe, right? I don't get outrage. <laughs> like if I stub my toe on a rock, I'm not outraged at the rock, right? Uh, so moral outrage is a specific kind of emotion. It's a distinct emotion, just like fear is distinct from joy, is distinct from uh, anxiety. You know, so so moral emotions seem to be these distinct kinds of emotions for which we have the capacity which following the argument would therefore signal a reality to which they are fittingly evoked. Okay, so, um, ergo moral realism, okay? So there's some, there's a reality to which moral emotions uh, fittingly respond, okay. Um, order, beauty, tips us off to the fact that something seems to be extending itself and loving us, and then through the beautiful, uh, something seems to be giving us a gift in and through the beautiful, and the beautiful seems to tell against us being purely uh, physical creatures. Uh, order seems to indicate that the universe is stamped 
with a sign that signals intelligence because order and the repetition of pattern seem to signal in these other domains, like in the domains of a board game or language or a building, the existence of this a kind of repeated pattern that tends towards a function seems to indicate an intelligence. It seems to be a sign that signals an intelligence from which it emanated. Similarly, the universe, which seems to be characterized by laws, uh, bears that same kind of sign. Contingency points to the fact that there seems to be a primal state of the universe, right? The truth of causal finitism suggests that there's an initial state of a state of affairs of being preceding all change from which consciousness, beauty and order and morality uh, emerge or emanate. And I want to suggest that those facts are best fitted to the existence of God. The existence of God accounts for all of those facts, namely the existence of a God who is the summation of all reality. So not some arbitrary God, not, you know, not like Zeus, but like a God that is the transcendent foundation of all reality that is in his own being the standard of goodness and beauty and consciousness and morality that is the source from which reality emanates. Uh, whoops, well, I, summing up the picture here, I did just a minute ago. Uh, so in other words, we live in a world in which we are communicated with on the level of the ethical and the aesthetic. We seem to live in a world of consciousness, there seems to be an original state which contains these potentialities for beauty, order, and consciousness, and physicalism seems to be false. The existence of God best accounts for it's a good fit with this picture of reality. Now, I want to argue more specifically for Christian theism. First, the Christian story uh, suggests that evil is ubiquitous. Uh, it's in all of us. If you live long enough, uh, you will find that you have done something you know was wrong, right? And all of us have done things we know were wrong and that we could have not done. So it's not just that like, oh, to err is human or whatever. That's not, first of all, it's not even true. But secondly, uh, it's not just that we all like make mistakes, right? That we all, oh, well, we're all just learning, right? Like, it's not like we all... You know, we all commit typos or whatever. Okay, yeah, sure. Like, that might be true. But it's worse. It's that we all do things we actually know are wrong. We all are accused by our own moral standards. We all fail to live up to our own standards of goodness. Okay? Now, the Christian story, to my knowledge, is the one story that acknowledges that that's ubiquitous and is a, is a good fit Uh with that reality, namely given the corruption, like the defacement of human nature, that there was a primal defacement uh, that sort of seeped down through the ages. The Christian story, the story, you know, it opens with the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. Uh, we covered this actually in the video on justification that I just put out, uh, that we were in communion with God and yet, we find ourselves living in a world that so often seems God forsaken. So divine hiddenness, it is a philosophical problem. And I, and I don't want to sort of minimize that problem at all. I think there are good ways to address divine hiddenness. But on the Christian story, divine hiddenness, at least the degree of divine hiddenness, is actually predicted. And it's, it's predicted not just as a way for God to sort of stir love in the human heart right like one suggestion for god's hiddenness is that uh it actually uh is a way of forming people to love him right as they seek him their love is formed in the process of seeking and i think that's true but divine hiddenness is first and foremost actually a judgment uh on humanity so our experience of God for sin. And now God hasn't left himself without a witness, right? It's why I can make these arguments at all. Uh, but the moments where, where the world seems God forsaken 
are accounted for in the Christian story, namely that we were actually exiled uh, collectively from the presence of God on account of our sin. Scripture is actually a really good fit with the structure of humanity. We order our lives by narratives, right? The, the story of scripture is actually the story of a collective narrative. Uh, it leads to Genesis 12, right? The Genesis 1 to 11 sort of gives us a picture of the human condition. And Genesis 12 onward is God's answer to the human condition. So the whole Bible forms a cohesive story, actually. And the reason that's incredibly fitting, rather than giving us a sort of code of exhaustive moral laws, is because we actually more often order our lives by stories. If you have a sort of narrative image of yourself, like one day I will be a doctor that serves you know, the most uh, underprivileged people, that sort of story that you have of yourself is actually going to order the kind of actions you take. You might then, on account of having that sort of story or that end point of your life, intend certain actions that lead up to that end point. Right? You might go to school to you know, acquire a degree and gain certain medical skills and work really hard and whatever. Right? Uh, it orders your life. And so what God does is he gives us a narrative that we're actually, as his people, supposed to internalize. And that narrative actually helps us interact in the diverse situations we find ourselves in, just as any story does. Now, the brilliance of the solution, the particular story, right? It, it involves, and I've, I've uncovered, I've unpacked this story, uh, you know, the sort of broader sweep of the story of Christianity on my channel. So I'll assume that here, but it centers on the election of Israel through Abraham, the building of a family. But if you remember, what does God say the purpose of electing Abraham is? He'll give Abraham a land so that through him, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Israel exists so that promise goes through Abraham to the nations to bless the nations. And blessing there you know, is the conveyance of joy. In other words, the conveyance of the presence of God as the story unfolds. That's how joy is unpacked. Uh, the, the holy presence of God filling all things. And that's that, of course, is the joy of Eden, right? Uh, the garden of delight. So that's literally what Eden means, uh, is delightful precisely because God's presence fills that, that space, right? So um, the reason why... I, I find this actually pretty compelling uh, is because God, what he does is he enmeshes. If we think about the world, right? The ancient world, incredibly tribal, right? We're tribal today, but the ancient world was so much worse, right? So it's a brutal, 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 brutal world in the ancient world. It's viciously tribal. And so what God does is he builds a people uh, that welcomes the sojourner, that welcomes the stranger, that has actually a mechanism for the stranger to join the family, and a people that are, are forced to talk to one another. And so God shapes this family towards Jesus, in whom the nations actually have to concretely face one another and are concretely reconciled to each other. Uh, so God takes human actors and through human actors, through the very agents of strife, God overcomes their strife. Uh, he actually sets human beings to the work of reconciliation amongst themselves by grace, such that God is the one reconciling the world. But in his very act of reconciling the world, that activates the human action of us being reconciled to one another. So in other words, there's no competition between divine and human agency, right? As divine agency operates, human agency is more fully alive within the sort of sway or stream of divine agency. So when God reconciles, the human action of being reconciled to one another is also fully activated. Now, I also think the atonement uh, is actually... Um, 
it makes a lot of sense. So, and people critique Christianity on this all the time, but it's really interesting. But um, the in our moral experience, we seem to have the sense that my good actions cannot make up for my bad actions, right? If I cheat or steal, right? If I cheat on my wife, like it doesn't matter if I help 99 grannies across the street, that doesn't erase the moral failure. And so you can't sort of blot out your moral failings by doing good deeds. You can't outweigh them. The story of scripture is a story in which you cannot outweigh your bad deeds by your good deeds. That's impossible. But the grace of God is has to reconcile you now if god is fully just the what the phenomena of sacrifice right stems from at least on the christian telling and i think this is true stems from the recognition that the divine is at odds with us and we 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 want to do something to appease that at oddness right we're trying to sort of expiate uh our debt to the divine uh, anger, the divine justice that we feel hangs over us. So why sacrifice is ubiquitous throughout religions. There's a collective sense of the divine being at odds with us. The atonement uh, is sort of the only solution uh, that makes sense as to why a just God could remain just, could satisfy the demands of justice. Uh, while still being gracious and merciful and kind and forgiving. Namely, because the Lord Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit, unites all of humanity to, to himself. Such that, look, like if you, were to, if you were to cut off my hand, that would be a punishment to me, right? That would actually be a condemnation of me. That is in certain societies, right? In a kind of similar way, Jesus elects to sort of form one organic whole with his people. He binds all people to himself by the grace of the Holy Spirit, such that when he offers up his body on the cross, he offers it up as the sign of the condemnation of all sinners which are in him, which are contained in his body by the work of the Holy Spirit, and therefore of every single human being. So what the Holy Spirit does is the Spirit makes present all of humanity to our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. And Jesus offers up his body on the cross as the icon, the picture of uh, the horror of sin. And that's actually, that's what justice does. So justice creates an icon in the life of the perpetrators of the severity of the crime. When someone is put on death row, right, or someone is sentenced to a lifetime in prison, that lifetime lived becomes a picture or an icon of the severity of their sin. In a similar way, Jesus' death on the cross is an icon of the severity of our sin. And it's a condemnation of us sinners, not Jesus. Uh, it's a condemnation actually of us uh, because Jesus offers up that body, which is linked to all people. In other words, God is condemning my sin by condemning my head. <laughs> so in the same way, right, you cut off my hand, that is a condemnation of me. In the death of my head, my sin is condemned. Now, that's payment paid. I can reject that. Uh, but, and Jesus pleads his blood upon faith for me. But the sacrifice is made and ready to be pled, right, upon faith. So I'll probably make a video on that uh, in more detail. And finally, I think the Trinity has such remarkable explanatory power. I've covered that in the beauty and fittingness of the Trinity in a prior video. Uh, I direct you there. And finally, I want to commend to you the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, most historians, and again, 
probably do a longer video on this as well. well I really could do a video on each part of this, um, videos on each part of this. But I think the evidence is actually really clear about these things. And most scholars at SBL, for whatever that's worth, would agree with this, that Jesus existed. He was a prophet, at least he thought he was a prophet, who proclaimed the kingdom of God, the reign and rule of God, and this fact is not conceded by most historians, just qualifying that, but I think it can be demonstrated. He believed himself to be God. I, I actually I really think the evidence actually points that way. Uh, Jesus of Nazareth was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He was believed to have been seen by the apostles and the twelve risen from the dead. Um, I, briefly, that last piece there, I would argue is actually confirmed in 1 Corinthians 15, because when Paul is preaching to the Corinthians, he does not have to explain who Peter is or Cephas is, or the 12. So uh, Paul says Jesus appeared to him, then to, or Peter, Jesus appeared to Peter, then the 12, uh, then James, then, you know, the other, the 500, then Paul, right? Something like that. Uh, Paul explains who none of those are to the, Corinth the Corinthians. In other words, he's just assuming that they know who he's talking about. Now, the reason I think that's remarkable is because Paul says, in, I think in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 15, whether it was I or they, so we preached and so you believed. In other words, he's assuming that the Corinthians have heard these people preach. <laughs> And, and earlier in the letter, right, he says, were you baptized in the name of Paul or Peter? You know, some say I follow Peter. Some say I follow Paul, right? He's assuming that they're familiar with these people <laughs> uh, and that they've heard from these people. In other words, if he's preaching a different gospel, the Corinthians would have known it. Paul's staking his credibility on the fact that they have preached the same gospel to the Corinthians that he has preached. And therefore, we have reason to think from that exchange, from the existence of the church in Corinth, and from Paul's communication to that church, that the church in Corinth was aware of Paul and Peter having preached to them of having seen the risen Jesus. Uh, it's unlikely. <laughs> the reason why most atheists reject the notion that they were just lying or making stuff up uh, is because... Uh, it was foolish to worship a crucified Messiah, right? That was silliness to the Jews, and it was, of course, silliness to the Greeks, right? Uh, to, to think that a crucified man uh, is the true savior of the world. That seemed silly. And, of course, a physical resurrection to the Epicureans and the Stoics uh, was absurd. So the disciples, to maintain that they're somehow lying, so either they stole the body or something like this, right, would be to say that they are willing to die for what they know to be, and die, or at least get persecuted, starved, deprived of resources, mocked, ridiculed for what they know to be a lie. What they know sounds foolish to those who they tell this to, what they know can get them killed, right? They're claiming to these Greeks, hey, your gods don't exist, right? It's not going to go over well, right? Um, and of course, in church history, the Christians get, they get persecuted for this, right? Uh, it causes social unrest to do that. Uh, and as Jews, remember, they, these were not atheists. In other words, as Jews, they would have been preaching something they knew stood against the God of Israel, because the God of Israel, so they had thought, uh, cursed those hung on a tree. At least that was the interpretation of that verse at the time. And um, it, it would have been the case that they thought that they were at least, they were going against the God of Israel. Uh, they were proclaiming someone as the Messiah who the God of Israel ostensibly had not proclaimed as the Messiah. That seems absurd, and it seems actually much better to think, no, they were actually genuine, right? So either they hallucinated, but joint hallucinations are incredibly rare, or maybe they saw him. Now, what we've seen is that the Christian story is actually a really good fit with the shape of our existence, I think. 
And what we've seen is that these other pieces um, of contingency and consciousness and order and beauty and morality point us in the direction of thinking the world is more than physical. And in fact, consciousness is ubiquitous, uh, pervasive in reality, that uh, reality, there is a primal state of reality from which, which is of course characterized by consciousness, from which um, order and beauty and morality emerge or emanate, that we live in an ordered world which bears the stamp of an originating intelligence. Uh, and that there's good evidence that the, the story, the shape of the world told by the Bible fits with the shape of human existence as we know it. I want to suggest that these pieces I've put forth to you find a really good home. They're predicted by, and in fact, fit into the story of Christianity as the story of the world. I hope this was helpful to you. Again, I'm going to, uh, in the editing process, hopefully in the next few days, link some of the resources in the uh, description of this video. Hope this is a blessing to you to stimulate further thought in your pursuit of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless. Bye-bye.